to change that. <laughs> All right. Well, good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church of Turbeville. I see that the word got out that uh, I'm here. I just want to tell you I'm not that good of a preacher, so you're going to be in for a huge disappointment this morning. But no, uh, today's a special day as we're getting ready to uh, dedicate Tommy, and I am excited about that. I always enjoy any time we can uh, thank God for what he has given us, which children are the most precious, and I see we got a little one over there. So uh, looking forward to this morning. I hope everybody had a blessed week. Um, Felicia made it to Honduras yesterday. Um, they had to wait at the airport. She didn't get to the place they're staying until it was like 8 o'clock last night. So she was good and hungry. They sat in a bus for a few hours waiting because one of the flights got canceled. But she's in Honduras. She appreciates the prayers and she appreciates the donations uh, that people gave towards the school supplies as well as cash for us to be able, for them to be able to buy uh, paper. Because uh, paper's heavy, so it's easier to buy it in country than to buy it and try and transport it and pay baggage fees or shipping fees. So, um, but she's there. And uh, she is excited and ready to get to work. So let's begin today's service with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for giving us the ability to come and worship you, God. You woke us up this morning. God, you've blessed us beyond anything that we've ever could have imagined or anything we've ever deserved. So God, if there's anyone here this morning that's struggling, I just pray that you wrap your loving arms around them, God, and remind them whose they are. Remind them who is in control. So God, be with our service this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You still standing there? What do we do to it? Come on. Good morning. 
I'm Alex. Thank you, choir. So at this time, we're going to welcome all children to come forward, and we're going to ask Uncle Mike to come up to give his children's time message. <laughs> oh, come on now. What you got? You got something to eat? That's Play-Doh. I used to eat it. <laughs> when I was little, I used to eat Play-Doh. And glue. And all kind of stuff. And my liver's still working. Do what? Oh, you ready for some jokes? <laughs> all right, all right, all right. What do you call a nun that sleepwalks? Uh-huh. A Roman Catholic. <laughs> yeah, me, knock, knock. Auto. I ought to know, but I forget. Oh, 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 knock, knock. CD. Y'all see the green stuff in the preacher's beard this morning? Y'all see it? I ain't going to tell him about it. Y'all don't say nothing. <laughs> All right, here's here's another one here. What do you call a preacher at the law uh, at, at the North Pole? At the at the North Pole? Uh, huh? <laughs> he lost. <laughs> He'd be lost up there. All right. So today we're going to talk about temptation. Do y'all know what temptation is? Y'all know what temptation? Give me some poop. Give me, give, tell me the poop. What's it? What, what is temptation? I want to know what it is. Doing something you ain't supposed to, you're tempted to do it. Somebody tempts you. Something is tempted. Right? Y'all check this here out. I brought this in this morning. It's in a bag. Now, when it jumps out, don't let it get you. Oh, God, it did. Almost got away, got away from me. Give me that. You can read. It's a what? Well, well that, you might, might might be right on that end, but what this end? Oh, okay, all right. Ten phone. I'll agree with you. All right, so see this little piece right here? That piece right there, y'all see that? You know what that piece does? Ooh. Mm. So you got that open. You got to turn the knob to get that thing to open. Lock the doors. That's true. That's when you jump up and do a drop kick kind of a thing. All right. I ain't tell it. So, this right here represents choices. In order for you to get inside that room, you got to turn the knob. You got to turn the knob. And it's the same thing with temptation. It's the same thing with sin. When sin happens, you actually got to be a part of it. And if you're going to walk inside that door, you got to turn the knob. When sin happens, when somebody says, be mean to that little boy, be mean to that little girl, you actually got to make a choice to do that. And that's where sin comes in. And when sin comes in, it's hard to get back out. All right? You all understand what I'm talking about? Let me give, let me give you a, a, a little a ver verse right here. This is Ephesians 4, verse 27. Do not give the devil an opportunity. In other words, if it's a door and you know what's behind it is sin, don't give him an opportunity. Don't open it up. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for these that you brought here today. We thank you for giving us opportunity to learn in a place that we feel safe. Lord, thank you for these parents that bring them today. And send me more, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, guess what I got in here? 
This is uh, some dinosaur toes I picked up. You want a dinosaur toe? A dinosaur toe? Dinosaur toe? Dinosaur toe? Here are dinosaur toes. Dinosaur toe? Dinosaur toe? Dinosaur foot? Dinosaur toe. All right. Thank y'all. Shut up. I'm sorry. I'm in church. All right, we're going to stand and sing hymn number 153, The Lily of the Valley. If you will stand and sing with me, please. few announcements this morning. Um, tonight, for Awana, it's Dress Your Favorite Decades Night. So for some of y'all, that's how you dress every day. But uh, for the for the, some of the folks, they got to actually get some stuff. But uh, please, uh, if you have children that are going to come tonight, have them dress up in their favorite decade. And then uh, please remember our diaper drive, which is for the Sumter Pregnancy Center. And again, I want to make sure we understand that they service not only Sumter, but Clarendon and Lee counties as well. Um, they're a faith-based organization, but their focus is on women who don't have anywhere to go and feel like abortion is the only uh, way. And so they have done a great job, but they're looking for diapers, one, two, and three. And uh, if you can bring them, if you didn't bring them today, that's fine. You can bring them anytime. They're always needing stuff as they have a ton of women that go through there. Then on the 25th of February, there's a youth outing on Friday. Can you hear me, Mary? I want to make sure you're getting the announcements. <laughs> but a youth outing on Friday, February 25th. And then today, we're taking, uh, still taking offering for Super Bowl. Because last Sunday, there was some confusion. I didn't do a very good job announcing it. Um, any loose money, anything that's not designated in the offering will go towards Super Bowl. And uh, that money will go to help a couple of um, a couple of events or a couple of organizations, if you will, if we raise enough. So 
Um, for birthdays, we have uh, Donald Bryant's birthday today. And you got a birthday coming up. Let me see here. We had Evan Whitlock was Monday. We got Donald Bryant's today. Then we got Ann, Johnny, and Therese Thursday, Friday. Friday. I better get an invite to that party. Um, well, she turned around and looked like I wasn't looking at her. All right, and then Myra, David, I hope you got something planned for next Sunday. It's Myra's birthday. All right. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm telling you, Myra and I, we, we connected, so she told me to keep an eye on you. Uh, but uh, are there any other announcements, anything that I'm missing? All right. Um, we have a ton that we need to be praying for, with, and about. Um, so this morning... Uh, please remember Joseph Johnson. Uh, as you know, we have our prayer list that's out there if anybody would like it. Um, but we have Joseph Johnson, um, who's 38 years old and dealing with congestive heart failure. Um, Alan Coker is currently in the hospital with uh, in Manning with congestive heart failure and some other issues. So please pray for him. Pray for Geraldine as well as she's constantly dealing with um, some issues. Miss Bessie May went to the doctor and they found out that um, her throat muscle some of them are weak and they believe it's from a minor stroke small stroke or however you label those things uh, so they're going to send her to speech therapy to see if they can strengthen that back up so continue to pray for her uh, joel has his neck surgery this thursday the 24th so please pray for him and then i found out two days ago Teresa broke her elbow and i believe she's going to the doctor tomorrow and she's hoping they don't have to do surgery so just pray for joel and Teresa. Continue to pray for Cecilia. She's dealing with cancer. Um, Margie and Bruce, as they're uh, they're doing a lot better. It's always good to see Freddie and Carol, especially Carol. You got a new one, huh? No? Oh, just collapses. All right. Any other prayer requests? <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Pray, pray for my wife as she's in Honduras this week. Thank you. All right, if there's no other prayer requests at this time, I'd like to invite uh, Deacon Tyler Boatwright to the front. The altar's open. Feel free to come forward and pray right here, or you can or pray at the altar, or you can pray right where you're at. Right. So the moment that all of you or most of you came for this morning, I'm going to ask that we lock the door so you can't leave once we're done. Um, but no, I like to have fun. All right, Jesus had fun on this earth. Just read the Bible. So I like to have some fun. But this morning, we get to dedicate Tommy. So I'd like to ask uh, Austin and Whitney and Tommy to come up as we dedicate this precious little boy. That picture you put on Facebook, was it yesterday of them two in bed? They look just alike. They look just alike. And so I'd like to welcome all the friends and family. Um, Whitney told me there's going to be a lot of you here. I know some of you, maybe a little more than a majority of you. But thank you all so much uh, for coming. And forgive me for not mentioning you by name, but if I did that, I'd forget somebody. So what we have today is that Austin and Whitney 
have come to give thanks for this blessing called Tommy. We will be dedicating Tommy to the Lord, praying that he would come to know and serve him. We also dedicate Austin and Whitney to God, asking that he would give them wisdom, understanding, knowledge, and ability to raise Tommy in the way of the Lord. And as a church, we dedicate ourselves to setting a godly example for Tommy so that he might one day come to trust in Jesus as his Lord and Savior. So I'd like to read from Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 7. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. So this is a letter that I'm fairly certain Whitney probably wrote, but it's from both of them. Um, But it says, Tommy, today, February 20th, 2022, is the day we, your parents, dedicate you to the Lord. We are so happy you are surrounded by your friends and family for this special day. We praise God for the gift that you are to all of us. And we feel truly humbled to help guide you in your earthly life and walk. We charge ourselves and those who surround you daily to lead you in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Savior. Jeremiah 29, 11 states, For I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. We promise to remind you often of the blessing that you are to our lives and to this world. We eagerly await or we eagerly await watching you grow and lead your own household one day in love and service to the church and community. Your parents, grandparents, and extended family and church family love you very much and will always be here for you. With all your love, Mama and Daddy. So then I got some questions for you, and when I ask them, all you got to say is we do. All right? So Austin and Whitney, do you recognize that Tommy is a gift from God and both thank God and glorify God for the gift of your son? Do you accept the joy and the responsibilities of parenting, promising to give proper love and care to Tommy throughout his life? With the help of God provides, with the help God provides, do you commit to teach Tommy the fullness of God's word and demonstrate through your own example and witness what it means to love God with all your heart, soul, and strength? All right, congregation, now it's your turn. I just got two for y'all. Will you offer your ongoing love, support, prayer, and encouragement to Austin and Whitney in their role as Tommy's parents? Say, we will. Will you also be faithful in praying for Tommy and as much as you are able, help teach and set a godly example for him so that he might one day come to trust in Jesus as his Lord and Savior? All right, I would like to pray uh, over you guys and Tommy. Father, we just thank you so much for this wonderful family. God, we thank you for the fact that they will stand up here and boldly proclaim that Tommy, this gift that you have given them, is yours. And they're so thankful for it. And so, God, I pray that you continue to give them the wisdom, continue to give them the strength and the discernment and the knowledge to know when and what and how to do. God, we pray for Tommy as your hand be upon him as he grows up. God, that we, he will do mighty things for you when he gets older. God, we thank you so much for everything that you do for us. God, thank you for the family and friends that are here this morning. But God, I want to pray that may you bless Tommy and keep him. May you make your face shine upon him and, be grac- and he be gracious to you. May, the, may, he turn, may you turn your face towards him and give him peace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so the final thing, and then you can take pterodactyl to the, have y'all, how many of y'all heard him scream? Yeah, so I'll be up there preaching, and I know, and I'll see Whitney get up about the third screech, um, but uh, he's getting somebody's attention. But on behalf of the church, your church family, um, we would like to present you with this baby dedication certificate, and this is to certify that Tommy, Tommy W.H. Floyd III was dedicated in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit at First Baptist Church of Turbeville on today's date and signed by me. So, thank you.
So Whitney sent me a bunch of pictures and said, I can't pick one, so figure it out. So I had Tyler come in and figure it out because they were all so cute. So in case some of you don't know, and there was an announcement I should have made, but uh, Will and Anna Bitten had their daughter yesterday. There was going to be a special this morning by, huh? Or two days ago, sorry. They're going to be released today, potentially, hopefully. Everything's good. Uh, but there was going to be a special by Whitney and Will, but Will is obviously predisposed. Um, so uh, we're just going to go right into the message because you do not want me singing a special. So where we're going to be this morning, unless William wants to come up with me. No? Okay. I mean, I tried. Um, so where we're going to be at this morning is Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, we're going to be in verses 33 through 37. So before we get there, I'd like to set the stage just a little bit about what's happening, what's been going on um, in Jesus and the disciples' uh, lives or time on the earth. So what we find in this passage today are two things that show the disciples still, up to this point, do not understand nor comprehend what Jesus is trying to tell them, what Jesus is trying to teach them. Now, those of you that had kids, you know how frustrating that is. I got a 21-year-old at home that I'm like, how many times do I have to tell you over 21 years, don't do this, or don't be this way, don't hang out with this type of folks, don't do whatever. We've all been there, right? It's like banging your head against a brick wall. Well, that's where Jesus was with the disciples. So there were the, the two things is they asked, um, or the two things they couldn't comprehend, right? Even though they knew the, the Old Testament, they had been taught the Old Testament, all the prophecies, and Jesus presenting himself as the fulfillment of all those prophecies, they still didn't understand who Jesus was. Nor and here's the kicker about this whole, uh, the one that we're going to focus on, is they didn't understand what his task on this earth was, that he was to die for our sins. And matter of fact, right before this verse, a few verses up, or these verses, a few verses up, Jesus had just told them again, notice I said again, that he was on this earth to die and it was going to happen soon. So they couldn't comprehend this for some reason, uh, no matter how long, I mean, he could—he was on the earth 33 and a half years before he was crucified, but he could have been on this earth another 100 years, and they probably still wouldn't have comprehended, right? And so what, what the two things that, we, um, that kind of bring us to that conclusion is, um, and these are in verses, the one we're going to use and then the one after, but it's who is the greatest, which is what we're going to be focusing on this morning. They, they were arguing, walking down the street arguing who is the greatest. Well, if they knew who Jesus was, they would know who the greatest is. And then the, later on, which, you know, John and James, uh, the sons of thunder, they always wanted to beat people up and burn cities down. And, you know, that was just kind of their MO. Well, there was some, they were upset. The disciples were upset because others were casting out demons in Jesus' name. As if they were the only ones that could do it. See, they were still focused internally. They weren't focused externally. They, they couldn't understand Jesus and who he was and why he was here. But they followed him, right? So we find the disciples, they're walking, they're heading back to Galilee from the region of Decapolis. Decapolis. So if you have your Bibles and you have not already, please turn to Mark chapter 9, verses 33 through 37. Did I give everybody time? All right. Austin, you there? Austin called me out once on that, so... I make sure I take time to let everybody turn to it. So in Mark chapter 9, verse 33, it says, And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve, and he said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all, and servant of all. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them, and taking him in the arms, he said to them, whoever receives, one such, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your words. God, I pray this morning as we just dedicate it, Tommy, God, that as we talk about who is the greatest God and what that means to our lives and how we're supposed to have childlike faith. God, I pray that this speaks to every person in here, God, that the Holy Spirit moves 
God, just help us to be your children. Help us to be your hands and feet. And we just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So what you see here, as soon as we get in, Jesus doesn't take long to get to the point, right? What does Jesus do? He's like, hey, what were y'all talking about? What was this discussion? Because obviously it was loud enough and probably raucous enough. There was enough going on that Jesus knew something was going on. There was some sort of argument. There was some sort of discussion amongst the disciples that he probably should get in the middle of as their teacher, right? So Jesus doesn't take long to say, hey, what were y'all talking about back there? Now, if you think he didn't know, we already knew he did because guess what? They never told him. What did it say? They were quiet because they knew they had been busted. They knew they had been busted. You know, just like kids, when you walk in a room, you're like, hey, who broke this? Not me. Well, it just did it by itself. So the disciples were, were, were acting like children. They, they didn't want to answer what Jesus had asked them. They kept silent. But see, Jesus felt that it was port, important enough to address. But I also want to note how he points in these verses to childlike characteristics to bring home his point. Because, see, in this time, children were not very, very highly viewed. The children were at home with the women. Um, matter of fact, uh, you know, they, would, they weren't even viewed as, uh, they were viewed as a resource more than anything. And so he took this thing that really meant nothing to a grown men, this child, not thing, this child that really, in their culture, didn't mean anything until they were old enough to maybe work around the house or do whatever they were supposed to do. And he used this child to a bunch of grown men to show who was the greatest. See, the first thing that he points out that we should have, which a lot of children have, is humility. Humility. Think about it. We must have an honest appraisal of ourselves. When was the last time we sat down and said, okay, how are we acting? How are we coming across? I don't know about you, but my 11-year-old didn't really start getting cocky until I was started talking trash to him and he understood what I was saying. Right? So, so I created that. But children come very humble. As a matter of fact, if you think about your salvation experience, you had to humble yourself before the cross. Because if you walked up and said, God save me, Jesus save me, because that's what you're supposed to do, what do you think would have happened? You think the Holy Spirit would have been in that? No. We're supposed to be humble in our walk with Christ. What's, who are we supposed to glorify? Who are we supposed to glorify? We're supposed to glorify God. And everything that we do, well, guess what? In order for God to be glorified, that means we have to be what? <laughs> Not glorified? It can't be about us. It's got to be about the team. It's got to be about him. So humility. And then this one gets me. I struggle with this every day, but day-to-day -day dealings with people. I wish I could just walk up and throat punch people or let them know how I feel or tell them that I'm the man and get out of my way and just do what I tell you. Right? I wish I could do that, but that's not who we're called to be as Christ followers. We're called to be humble. So the first thing that we see in here is um, in verse 30, uh, 35, he says, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all. If anyone be first, he must be last of all. Now, does that mean that we need to put ourselves down, right? I want to make sure we understand. Does that mean we can't have nice things? Does that mean we can't enjoy some of the finer things in life? Of course not. Of course we can, because that's God's blessing on our life. But remember, no matter what we do, it's all got to be to the glory of God. It can't be about us. It has to be about him. And then it, he follows, and servant of all, in verse 35. See, the question here is, how can we be used by God in the service to others? or in the service of others. Now, obviously, Jesus Christ is the prime example, right? This is what the disciples could not get. This is what the disciples could not understand. He was going to be the ultimate servant. He was going to give up his life, even though he didn't have to. 
even though he didn't want to, remember he prayed in that garden, but what did he say? We bring that up all the time, but it's a beautiful illustration of how we should live our lives. What did he say? God, if there's any other way, take this cup. But what did he say? Not my will, but thine be done. And guess what he did? He died on that cross for our sins. He was the ultimate service servant. He washed the feet of his disciples. And oh, by the way, it was all 12 of them. So guess who was there? Old Judas, the same one that betrayed him not too long after that. That's where my biggest struggle is. How do I treat my enemies? And Jesus knew he was going to he was going to betray him. But how do I serve my enemies? How do I serve those maybe that I don't know? How do I serve those maybe that don't look like me? How do I serve those that maybe don't think like me? How do I serve others? See, we are called to be servants. And you might ask, you know, what does that look like? Well, if you live in my house, you have chores. Now, they whine and cry a lot about them now, and they roll around on the ground to get all dramatic. But they do dishes, they clean their room, um, started making Connor do his own laundry, because I don't, well, and my laundry, because I don't want to do it. Um, but children do things in the house, right? And maybe your children are lucky enough not to have to do it, but their service, they're, they're providing a service to the family. Now understand, back in those days, boys and girls provided a service in their home. The boys were highly thought of because they can go work the field. They can go with dad. They could do certain things. Women, girls were back at the house making sure things were clean, making sure food was cooked, uh, making clothes, making rugs, doing things of their time. They provided a service. But here's what I want you to think about. I want you to think about a child that is looking for approval. Think about a child that is looking for approval. And I believe this is every child up to a certain point. Because at some point, life finally gets them. And we have all seen those kids. Now, they will do anything to get said approval, right? Isn't that how we should be at times? Now, understand what I'm saying. Not that we are seeking God's approval. We have already got it through the blood of Jesus Christ. But we should want to please Jesus simply for what he has done for us. We should want to serve him. Again, not, uh, again in humility, not because it's something that we're going to get, not because it's uh, going to get our names on the bright lights, not because we're going to become the next Joel Osteen, but because of what he has done for us. See, it shouldn't matter how many people are in the room. It shouldn't matter how many people see what you're doing. Matter of fact, you should do it despite how many people are watching. And if you're one of those that you know you like glory, you know you like the pats on the back, go out of your way to do the stuff that's in secret, that maybe nobody knows about, right? Maybe go to town hall and pay a water bill for somebody who can't afford it. They don't need to know who did it, but they know it's paid. Because see, what we should do as Christ followers, we should all be looking for that well done, thou good and faithful servant, as Paul pointed out. That's what we all should be looking for. That's the only pat on the back we should want as Christ followers is when we get to heaven, Jesus, God looks at us and says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Because guess what? There are folks that have sat in church their whole life. There are folks that were born and raised in church that are not going to hear that. They're not going to hear that. There might even be folks sitting in here this morning that will die and go to hell someday. And it's because we forget who's the greatest. We latch on to some theology or we latch on to some preacher. We latch on to some Bible or some thought or you name it. Something that man has taught us or man has told us that we're supposed to to do what we're supposed to understand and we forget all about Jesus but we think we're doing it in Jesus' name I mean just turn on the TV and then lastly he talks about innocence and this is where Jesus takes that child and puts him on his lap and says if you don't come like this child if you don't receive this child you don't got it. You don't understand. 
See, when it comes to children, we think a lot of times that their innocence is foolishness. We think a lot of times their innocence is foolishness. But see, all, all that we're doing is we're trying to mold them to be disgruntled like us, upset like us. We're not teaching them what Jesus wanted us to teach them. We're not leading them to the, down the right path. See, this is where we get into our denominations, maybe what we believe, right? So think about this. What do you believe? What do you believe? Do you truly believe the Bible in every word that it says, or you just believe some version of it? You just believe some version of it. Do you truly believe in Jesus or just some version of him? The blonde hair, blue eye, which that wasn't Jesus. I'm just going to tell you that. Maybe it's the Jesus that just wants everything to be good for you and he wants to give you a million dollars and that nice new car. Or maybe you believe in that God who is just sitting up there waiting to punish you for every little thing that you do. See, because if you're on either side of the extremes, guess what? You don't know the real God. You don't know the true Jesus. See, when we talk about childlike faith, children have no preconceived notions. They haven't been tainted by the world. They haven't been uh, 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 shown any different. They have no preferences. They don't care if flowers are up here. They don't care if we have hymn books. They don't care if there's a pulpit. They don't care if there's pews. They just know what they get out of being here. See, they simply love Jesus because this is what we teach them, right? Because he first loved them. They simply love Jesus because he first loved them. And see, I'll stand up here in the pulpit. We'll we'll stand up in Sunday school class and we'll, we'll preach that. But do we truly love him because he first loved us? Or is our love for him conditional? based upon the sickness that's in our family or based upon the money that's in our bank account or based upon the job that we have. See, children don't have any of that. That's what Jesus was talking about when he put that child in his lap. All that stuff that we as adults, because of the things we've experienced in this world, and it's a lot easier said than done, but we have to put all that aside when it comes to our relationship with Jesus Christ. There's a reason why he says, take my yoke upon you. Because it's easy and my burden is light. He wants you to take whatever nastiness you've got on your shoulders, whatever you've dealt with for your how many years on this earth, and he wants you to drop them at the cross and pick his up. That's where we get our hope from. Because we know that no matter what happens, no matter what has happened, no matter what's going to happen, that in the end we're still going to be in heaven. That in the end, we're not doing it alone. We have him. And again, the children are not hardened by this world and the ugly, ugly things that people do. And I get it. There is a certain point where some kids, they kind of learn that a little bit early. But I can tell you, you go into any preschool, any preschool, and you're going to see a bunch of innocent little kids. They don't have a care in the world. They just want to be loved, and they want to love. See, this is how we should come to Jesus, relying solely on him and what his word says. We have to forget the hurt, we have to forget the pain, and we have to forget the anger. See, Jesus has already taken care of that for us. We know this because he says, I have overcome the world. See, the world represents all that nastiness that we are collecting in our lives, that we're keeping in our heads, that we're holding in our hearts, we're, we're, we're messing up our souls. He's overcome all that. So when we approach him, we need to approach him like a child. Like we've never experienced any of that. Like nothing has ever happened like that before. So the questions I have, and I've got a lot of them, do we believe that this morning? Do we believe what Jesus was telling his disciples when he sat that child on his lap? 
And then if we believe it, are we being that example to the kids, to our kids, to the kids in this church, the kids in the community that we may come in contact with? Do they see the love of Jesus Christ? Do they see our humility? Do they see our servanthood? The willing to sacrifice what we want for them. Just like Jesus Christ did on the cross. And are we coming to them with childlike innocence? Or are we dumping all the stuff that we've ever dealt with onto them? And just creating another us. See, this morning, we got to witness the dedication of Tommy. This little boy will be humble. This little boy is going to seek approval from his parents. And then he's going to innocently, innocently follow what he is taught. And oh, by the way, church, friends, family, you don't get out of this. Because you have a huge part in how Tommy is going to be raised what he's going to believe, what he's going to see. Do we cultivate that childlike innocence? Or do we just want him to be disgruntled like us? Do we want him to care about the color of the carpet? Do we want him to care about the color of the paint on the walls? Or do we want him to care about Jesus Christ and his walk with him? So if we're going to lead these young people, if we're going to lead other young people within our community, then we better come to Jesus as a child. Because there's no other way. Anything else that we try to do, we're just spitting more man-made garbage at them. We have to be like children when it comes to our saving faith. Put all that other stuff aside. So as the musicians come, Jesus wants us to be humble. He wants us to serve, and he wants us to be innocent in our approach to him. Any other way, and we're simply missing the mark. So I want to encourage you as the musicians play, the altar's open. You can pray right where you're at. If you don't know this Jesus, talk to somebody. Grab somebody around you or wait till after the service or come down front, however you want to do it. But we have to get back to that innocence. We have to get back to that humility. We have to get back to serving others, just like Jesus Christ showed in his perfect life. So as the musicians play, the altar is open.
Thank you all so much for being here this morning. Uh, thank you, Whitney and Austin, for allowing me to be there with you as we dedicated that precious little angel. Uh, they grow up, though. Um, not to ruin that for you. <laughs> you saw my daughter running around. Um, but uh, thank you all so much for being here this morning. And uh, I just want to encourage you this week to just think about, are you childlike in your faith? Or have you just grown cold and hardened? Come back tonight, 5.30, uh, for Awana. Choir practices at 5. Um, and then diapers. Don't forget diapers. If you brought diapers, uh, we're going to put them in uh, Donna's office. Tommy, you mind closing us out in prayer, sir?